good afternoon everyone i am extremely happy that we could conduct the online book talk this afternoon we been doing doing it for in the seminar hall uh, for for a while but last year because of some reason we couldn't do it properly so today the book talk comes to you with a new feature we have selected a particular theme and students will be working on that particular theme and i think that would ensure both coherence and variety to the book talk and students will be able to identify literature tensions very easily if you do in that uh, when you give a foundation to them so without uh, further ado i request aishwarya unni of second ma english to officially welcome everyone thank you and have a nice thank you ma'am welcome is to show honor to welcome is to show integrity greetings one and all myself aishwarya here to present a welcome speech for our online book talk on 20th century african literature i take this privilege to warmly welcome every one of you to this virtual function before we begin this online book talk i would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all of you who sincerely committed to this virtual event to make it a success first of all i would like to welcome our honorable and respected hrd professor and dr anjana ji who has made an introduction and known among us all of us for her wisdom knowledge and her never ending support with a spring in my step and a suspicion in my heart i warmly welcome all our teachers in the department and the coordinator of the program sita vijay kumar who all chiseled and shaped our lives and helped us to become a good citizens it's the time to chill to cheer to shine and to inspire i extend a gracious and inclusive welcome to our participants yes dear friends you are the gift of the god precious pearls of the society and the building rock of the strong nation a very friendly and a lovable welcome to you dear friends now i request our dear hrd dr anjana j to speak a few words thank you aishwarya for that wonderful words uh, good afternoon everyone teachers and my dear students actually um, as sida has said we have been doing this uh, book talk for a while but uh, there was a kind of a bit of a uh, break in between last year we couldn't do it because of so many other entertainments i mean not entertainment engagements so uh, this year uh, because of this pandemic we couldn't start it uh, but now um, though late we have um, you know we are back with the bang and uh, i really congratulate all the paper presenters today and sita for selecting a particular theme because uh, that will help uh, these students to uh, have a wider perspective of um, different areas instead of having um, a medley of um, writers now they are focusing um, on each book talk we'll have we we'll focus a uh, we have a focus on different um, uh, regional uh, regions like today it is african now next time maybe probably it is indian or south asian or uh, and the like so um, this is actually a venture by the department for um, making you to read more see uh, as students of literature um, the basic um, quality that you should have is uh, to read each and every word that comes uh, into your you know friend so um uh, the, the syllabi you know the syllabi that uh, you have to in, you have to widen the horizon of your learning or reading beyond the syllabi so this big big talk is a, our uh, attempt to um, towards that so we have this last week we have also started a reading room in the google classroom hope you are aware of that those who have not yet joined it please do it um, as early as possible so we are trying to we are planning to post a pdf of pdf of um uh, i mean good works um weekly and each one of you has to read through that 
and uh, you have to leave your comments there. So that is an English reading room. The entire department is there, including teachers and the students. So together we will read and we will flourish or progress. And I congratulate all the uh, participants and I request all the, um, uh, not all the, all the participants or the listeners to listen to their presentation and ask them questions. If you don't have any questions, just uh, give your suggestions or your observations. Just tell them that it was really good presentation. And um, hope all, all of us will have a very fruitful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Let's officially begin our program. I welcome each and every one of you here. So let's begin our program. First, I would like to call Vijaya Lakshmi of Second MA, and she is going to present on Pick Up by Nadine Bodiman. Thank you, Aishwarya. Ma'am, audible, Ano? Okay, Ka Vijaya Lakshmi, you can continue. Okay, ma'am. Good afternoon. So let's start our presentation. To discover the exact location of a thing is a simple matter of factual research. To discover the exact location of a person, where to locate the self, states the South African writer Nadine Godheimer in her post apartheid novel, The Pickup. Today, I'm reviewing this award-winning novel by Godheimer. So let's move to the review. As I said earlier, the author of the novel, The Pickup, is Nadine Godheimer, a South African writer, political activist, and recipient of 1991 Nobel Prize in Literature. Having grown up in post-colonial South Africa and being of the strongest critics of the apartheid system that deprive people of their identity, the essence of their being, Godaimo was active in the anti-apartheid movement and joins the African National Congress during the days when the organization was banned. And she became something like a moral institution in South Africa. Godaimo achieved lasting international recognition for her works, most of which dealt with political issues, as well as the moral and psychological tensions of her racially divided home country. So moving to the novel, The Pickup. The Pickup is her 13th novel and was published in 2001. It has already picked up a major literary award the 2002 Commonwealth Writers' Prize for the best book from Africa. In addition to having been included on the final 24 Booker Prize longlist for 2001, the novel, which has its place in what Godeme has called a post-apartheid literature of transition, it takes its subject matters, the issues of displacement, migration, search for self, or identity, etc. Theme of identity and otherness is one of the most important theme in apartheid literature. They are prevailing throughout the novel and are examined from a new and interesting perspective. This perspective, perspective that's in line with the political transformation of South Africa, moreover, a theme that is extremely relevant in the 21st century with its increased emphasis on globalization. Gautima develops all these themes by narrating the story of two young lovers, Julie Summers and Abdu or Ibrahim Ibn Mazza. Julie belongs to a prestigious white family and Abdu, a dark-skinned illegal immigrant who holds a degree in economics but work as a motor mechanic to prevent detection and deportation. The setting is initially contemporary Johannesburg, South Africa, where Julie lives in a cosmopolitan environment, but the setting then moves to the small town Arab city 
most probably in not in africa but the when ibrahim or abdu is deported and julie accompanies him as his wife the arab state is fictional and uh, the novel which turns an incisive eye on the complex layers of belonging and unbelonging that make up the immigrant experience godema has always been concerned with how differences racial and economic would keep a pattern bind us together as a post apartheid novel the pickup concerned the plight of illegal immigrants who still remain disenfranchised non citizens non citizens in so many parts of the world the character of abdu was a symbol of all these immigrants and their sufferings in arabic the name abdu or abd which translate to servant it is more interesting that ibrahim chooses to call himself the name abdu while living as an illegal immigrant in south africa the name suits that of his marginalized position in south african society where he lives as a servant for the whites in his determination to succeed and achieve material prosperity and thereby importing his name it symbolizes the harsh reality of the so called globalization era all divisions like the social hierarchy still prevail and there is very little equality in the world the novel centers mainly on themes of search for self and otherness in the central characters the protagonist wrestles with the difficult question of how and where to find themselves at home in the world a search to find their true self a place to be a place to belong ironically their search leads in opposite directions the homelessness of white julie in her own rich privileged country represent the growing insatisfaction of europeanized young people and the plight of illegal immigrant abdu is hated towards his poverty strike and homeland the arab streets and his earnings to emerge in a consumer society and to become a wealthy man of high social status all are part of it the other portrays her characters search for identity against a rich and finely woven tapestry of cultures locally normally and globally The novel is an impressive example of how a person goes to great lengths because they happen to be born with the wrong nationality. In the meantime, Godima reminds us that wealth does not always mean material wealth. The pickup is not a difficult nor lengthy read but can be very thought provoking. The famous literary critic Edward Said commented about the novel that it's a masterpiece of creative empathy a gripping trail of contemporary anguish and unexpected dissail it's quite sure that this novel is a mastercraft of nadine kotimo her writing style is simple and impressive and the use of literary devices such as visual imagery simile and the use of syntax also adds an impressive impression impression stick outlook to the novel moreover the way she told the story leaves one with much to think about it's really for provoking one thank you vijay lakshmi thank you aishwarya uh, any questions from anybody we'll have the discussion at the end aishwarya okay ma'am okay uh, next i welcome abana vijayan of second ma and she is going to present on famished road by ben okri ben okri uh, one second abana if you can join your video that would be better 
because since we are recording it and we are trying, trying to upload it in our department um, YouTube channel, it will be better if you can uh, switch on your camera, your video. ബൈ ഓക്രി Before going to present the review I like to introduce the writer before you Ben Okri Ben Okri is a Nigerian poet novelist and short story writer who is best known for his man booker prize winning novel The Famished Road He was born in Nigeria although he spent part of his childhood in London and later returned to England to study comparative literature at the University of Essex His work is often influenced by African and other myths and frequently explores topics such as poverty, political instability and identity. He used magical realism to convey political and social chaos in the country of his birth. So let's move on to the novel. The Famished Road tells the story of Asaru who is an abicu or spirit child. Unlike most abicus who died at young age to return to the spirit realm and later be reborn Asaru chooses to remain in the material world to make his mother happy His family's poverty and the political turmoil in his country means that his life there is far from easy But as he grows up he begins to understand the world and find out what truly gives meaning to life The novel is a f- novel is the first part of trilogy. It was followed by Songs of Enchantment and Infinite Riches. It won the Man Booker Prize, n- sorry, the 1991 Man Booker Prize and remains Okri's best known work. Despite being 500 pages long, the novel has only four main characters. Azaro the spirit child his mother and father and madam koto the bar owner the spirit child is a central myth in nigerian folklore while we are discussing 20th century african literature the relevance is to be given to the african mythology and religious perspectives of the novel isn't it so let's examine from these point of views Ben Okri grew up in a tradition where there are simply more dimensions to reality mingle with legends myths ancestors and spirit and death His creation as a hero also gives an impression of being a part of a society and culture where the real and imagined blend Nothing is completely real everything is is bizarre and weird This novel series is full of headed spirit malevolent masquerades and pregnant goddesses african myth religious elements culture and philosophy find no escape in the work of ben okri in the famish road igbo and yoruba believe that abicu children agrees to be born into the world of heartless and blind human being is presented in multiple dimension The poverty of the people there is presented immersed in their religious ideology. One perspective is haunting spirit world which tries to exploit helpless human. The other one present human beings as heartless leading a political perspective. Okri views Asaro not only as an abicu but as a panoptic vision of Nigerian negativism and wrong tendencies. He wants the public aware of the corruption in Nigeria. Hence, he is able to combine religious and realistic elements. The novel is generally regarded as the classic of magical realism. So, there requires an explanation and also the use of magical realism and the representation of politics and history. In the famished road 
Ben Opry uses the techniques of magical realism, interviewing magical elements with real experiences in a realistic atmosphere. The magic reality in the famished road is not something created by imagination, but rather something inherent in West African myths. The magic elements of the novel are in harmony with Nigerian culture beliefs and values. Okri, who has provided the most sophisticated expression of magical realism in African literature today, di directly derives his material from the culture of West Africa and provides the amalgamation of Yoruba mythology, West African oral tradition, conventional European realism and Latin American magical realism in his novel. By mingling African, Latin American and European narrative method, he attempts to investigate some certain areas of the African consciousness such as African power of imagination and creation and spirituality and elasticity of aesthetic in African culture as a result of which we can produce a colonialist and counter-recolonialist narrative discourse. Although Ben Okri as the harbinger of the contemporary Nigerian novel, the link between the old and the new follows in the footsteps of the Nigerian authors such as Daniel O. Faguna, Amos Tutuwala, Wal Soyinga and Ch Chinua Achebe. By producing as a post-colonialist author, he separates himself from the aim of his literary precursors who spent great effort in great effort, especially in the 1960s and 1970s to verify the strength and authenticity of African culture over imperialist, colonialist cultural norms. The Famished Road, as an example of post-colonial magic realistic war fiction, functions as Ben Okri's socio-political weapon to fight against imperial, colonial, neo neo-colonial forces as well as social, political, economical and cultural cor corruption and to provide change and improvement. Taking advantages of the subversive power of magical realism, the novel merges power of the novel merges the literary traditions of Africa, Europe and Latin America with a philanthropic and universal vision through the local. The function of Okri's distinct type of magical realism is the same as the function of third eye, which suddenly opens out of the center of his forehead and makes him perceive the world brighter and better. Through, through its third eye, the famished road attempts to free the human mind from all restriction to monitor the world from a different perspective to uncover hidden fact, to highlight social and political reality, and to document history. The Famish Road is a novel that set out not to tell the conventional narrative, but to map and explain an entire way of life and an entire worldview, that of an Africa where myths are real, the dead are ever present, and the line between dream and reality is blurred. As Lisa Clements said, the famished road is a kind of journey that you wish to retake every few years, mimicking themes of reincarnation and echoing the life imitating art mantra. It's a completely immersive experience that invokes a reflective response from the reader, steering the kind of wondrous allure through Ben Okri's melodic, melodic prose as his protagonist experiences life itself. Thank you all. Thank you, Abarna. Next, I welcome Sri Lakshmi S. of Second MA, and she is going to present on Purple Hibiscus by Adiji. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I wish to talk on Shibamanda Ngozi Adichie's Purple Hibiscus. Adichi, an established third generation African writer, is renowned for her exploration of post-colonial fractured identities. She has earned her celebrity status as a result of both her art and her politics to the diminishment of neither. She was described in the Times Literary Supplement as the most prominent 
of the procession of critically acclaimed young anglophone authors which is succeeding in attracting a new generation of readers to african culture purple hibiscus her first novel published in the year 2003 as a genuine example of an exploration of identity set in a time when colonialism was influencing the nation culturally socially and spiritually the novel explores the repercussions of these on one individual identity through the opening line things starts to fall apart at home adichie refers to chinua achbe's novel things fall apart and pays tribute to him who helped to create an identity for african literature in the modern literary tradition as we have all know that adichie did not believe in single handed story so she decided she wanted to give multiple perspective of nigeria and this multiple perspective of nigeria as what she is trying to bring about through the novel purple hibiscus the story takes place in nigeria and we are mainly following a 15 year old girl named kambli and her brother jaja their father yuji is an extremely wealthy man in the area they live in a very beautiful very modern house they go to one of the best private schools they have really had to want for anything in terms of like food or trades or anything like that however their father is also an extremely religious person and dangerously so yuji rules his family with an iron fist forbidding them to speak their native language in public punishing them for severely and for many things his wife beatrice even has two miscarriages because of eugene's violence he uses religion as a way to discipline his family and uses it to an extreme which it's not supposed to be used to but then one day one of kambli's aunt ifuma and cousins come to visit and they end up convincing kambli's father to let kambli and jaja go visit them at their home ultimately kambli and jaja leave to aunt ifoma eugene's sister who lives with her three children in the nurturing environment on of aunt ifoma kambli and jaja's eyes are open to what the rest of the world lives like basically and the types of privileges they have and the types of privileges other people have compared to them things like that so kambli and jaja become more open and more able to form and voice their own opinions though eugene and ifoma are siblings both are antithetical to each other eugene is a very rough character and for him religion is everything and perfection is the goal his behavior towards everyone as almost like a colonial master but on the other hand aunt ifoma she's a widowed single mother with three children and she's a struggling university lecturer although she is struggling her intellectual class allows her to resist her brother's use of material power to force her version of catholicism upon his dependents and public pressure to remarry she is a decolonizing as well as a depatriarchalizing figure through the character ifoma kambli and jaja realizes their immense possibilities and also the boundaries of their father and his strict rules ultimately a critical mass raised in terms in the lives of kambli when betrays poison her husband yuji but it was jaja who goes to prison the novel ends in almost 3 years after these events with a strong sense of hope optimism and liberating towards the self we have all know that harichi's main strength is dialogue as her character speak one hears the voice of modern nigeria purple hibiscus it's not the story of a mere adolescent girl coming of age instead kambli is telling a story that is bigger than she is purple hibiscus gives kambli the chance to find her own voice the title purple hibiscus it denotes hybrid variety that is the hybrid nature of kambli that she get from aunt ifuma house here we can see that adichi breaks the single storyline and brings multiple stories the novel deals adeptly with themes of language and silence throughout the book 
characters struggle with the task of communication. This is a novel of silence, of things left unsaid. What makes Papa Hibiscus so interesting is the position of the family within the larger picture of Nigeria. This is a story about Nigeria's recovery from colonialism because Eugene was among the first generation to come into contact with the European missionaries. Yeah, and his family converted to Christianity. And for Eugene, religion is everything and perfection is the goal. In the novel, Papa Hibiscus, and she uses very straightforward language. And she doesn't overly decorate her words as it is told from the perspective of a 15-year-old girl. So it feels very much like we are in her head, the whole story, and we are seeing this from her point of view. Also, the characters are so fully fleshed out and so complex in the absolute perfect way. Even the character that we hate, we also have a kind of feel bad for at the same time. And she does a really good job of showing both the positives and negatives of every character in the story. Through the novel, Adichie is providing this sort of coming of age story for this young girl. It's very much about her eyes being open not only to the rest of the world, but also the people in her life and what they are truly like. The novel also explores the complex feeling that we can have for people who are in our life, particularly family members. Even though it is clear that Kambli's dad doesn't do great things, and even Kambli's eyes are being open to those things, she still cares about her father. So she has these conflicting emotions within her about what she do about her different situation. So it's about the balance and complexity that we can find in those types of situations. Thus, the novel begins in silence and ends in silence. But the silence from the beginning is different from the end. It ends with the metamorphosis of Kambli with new hope. Finally, Kambli wins over the post-colonial power against her. She is the real purple hibiscus who has made her roots strong, who no longer needs the help of anyone to grow. Thank you. Thank you, Sri Lakshmi. Next, I welcome Megha S.J. Kumar of 2nd MA, and she is going to present on The Old Drift by Nambeli Serpent. Thank you, Aishwarya, for your warm welcome. Wishing all a great day. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to introduce a book. The book that I wish to present today is a novel titled The Old Drift by Kala Nambali Serpent, a Zambian writer. Namali Serpil was born in Lusaka and lives in New York. She is a recipient of a 2020 Vidam Campbell Prize for Fiction. In 2014, she was chosen as one of the Africa 39, a Hay Festival project to identify the most promising African writers under 40. In 2011, she received a Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award. Her first published story, Muzungu, was selected for the Best American Short Stories 2009 and shortlisted for the 2010 Kane Prize. She went on to win the 2015 Kane Prize for the SAC. She is a professor of English at Harvard University. Her first book of literary criticism, Seven Modes of Uncertainty, was published in 2014 by Harvard University Press. Her second book of essays, Stranger Faces, is forthcoming with Transit Books in Fall 2020. Her nonfiction book, American Psychoanalysis, is forthcoming with Columbia University Press. The oldest, her debut novel, has won the UK's top prize for science fiction, the Arthur C. Clarke Award, which judges describe as stealth sky fi This 576 pages novel belongs to other genres like family life fiction, literary fiction, and cultural heritage. Normally, Serpa's audacious first novel, The Old Riff, is narrated in small part by a swarm of mosquitoes, Tim Trabados, the bear ruinous square, who declared themselves as man's greatest nemesis. Serpa's mosquitoes observe the descents of wriggling humans in this novel, and they are distinctly unimpressed. The reader who picks up The Old Riff 
is likely to be more than simply impressed. This is a dazzling book as ambitious as any first novel published this decade. Serpil seems to want to stuff the entire world into her novel. Biology, race, subjugation, revolutionary politics, technology, etc. But it retains a human scale. There is a vein of magical realism in her work, like one woman strikes almost literal rivers. Another has hair that covers nearly her entire body and that grows several feet a day. That will spark warranted comparison to novels such as Salman Rushdie's Midnight Children and Gabriel Garcia Marcus's 100 Years of Solitude. Circle does not try to charm her readers to death. Her men and women characters are not cute and they are not caricatures. Even the most virulent racists in the old dress are in one dimensional. This work is a matrilineal epic. It is packed with grandmothers, mothers, daughters. They are hardly placed on pedestals or lit by false, ennobling or terminal light. They are all struggling. The plot of the old dress is not simple to unpack. The book begins at the start of the 20th century at a colonial settlement on the banks of the Zambezi River called the Old Drift. A dam has been constructed that will change many lives, a dam that some wish to bring down. The first women we meet beginning around 1940 are Sibylla, a white girl, Agnes, a pale and mad and blind British girl who marries a black professor and engineer, and Mada, a bright girl whose prospects collapse after she becomes pregnant. She is this novice copious weeper, the heartbreak queen of Kalingalinga. Later, we get to know their daughters. One operates High Fly Hair Cutry and Designs Limited. Another is a stewardess who once had artistic ambitions. One of these daughters has a long affair with a doctor who is working on a vaccine for a child. The third generation goes on to work on micro drones, on further AIDS research, and on political protests seeking redress for the wrongs of history. One character also works on the vexing future of wearable technology, digital bead-like chips implanted into the skin that with the help of permanent tattoos of conductive ink turn one's hands into approximations of smartphones. Government is controlling us, one character says near the end of the novel, and the worst part is we choose this. Circle carefully husbands our resources. She unspools her intricate and overlapping stories calmly. Small narrative hunches pay off big later, like cherries coming up on a slot machine. Yet she is such a generous writer. The people and the ideas in the older, like dervishes, are set whirling. When that whirling stops, you can hear the mosquitoes again. They are still out there. They sound like tiny drones. They sound like dread. The old drift offers a view of human history characterized by generative mistakes from Dr. Livingston's fatal calculation about the source of the Nile to evolution itself. Don't forget, evolution forces the entirety of life using only one tool. That mistake to err is human. But the second half of that maxim, the part about forgiveness, isn't mentioned. You get the sense it might be beside the point to surpass youngest generation of characters with their scalding assessments of injustice and cruelty by those in power. They are not here to forgive. They are here for the rebellion, revolution. Thus, I would recommend others to read the oldest novel because through the stories of three overlapping families, European, African, and Indian, she presents the history and future of Zambia through colonialism, Zambian independence, the AIDS epidemic, the ill-fated Zambian space program, the Kariba Dam revolution, and forward into the age of mass surveillance and drone warfare a mastery of language, a deafness in description, and a dip into surrealist and speculative elements makes the older a worthwhile study in holding together several storylines through the characterization of those searching for their calling and the coast of their pursuits. In sections of the grandmothers, the mothers, and the children, Namwali breaks together three families' lineages near the start of the 20th century, to a more immediate future in 2023. The journey begins with a matriarch, one of which is Martha, a young astronaut in training whose exuberant spirit dissolves due to continuous loss until she becomes known in her village as a woman unable to 
stop crying. And we conclude in a sort of present day with the children, including headstrong millennial Nyla, whose relationships are as unsteady as Sir Rebellious aims. The women and men in the older expose the idealism of unification and the reality of floundering to find place. My interest in the oldest came from my own leaning towards multi-generational stories. And Circle's novel satisfied my predilection, taking me from Europe to what was the colonized Northern Rhodesia to present-day Zambia. The oldest, a burial site of Europeans who aim to settle in Zambia, is a character, but more so a figure, a representation of what was and what is and what could be as each generation has a part to play in its construction and even its demise. From the late 19th century, where a white man makes claim to land that is in his to several years into the future, where technology is part of our bodies, the old rift laces together transcontinental narratives, the repercussions of colonization and reform through varied perspectives, including omniscient trans narrators who see all and playfully predict what is to come. This is all that I have to say about the novel. Hope you all would find this book interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Megha. Uh, let's have a discussion now. Teachers would like to add something. Uh, yeah, Sri Lakshmi, there is a question from Sri Prasad Sir towards you. Advait, can you read uh, those questions? If it... Actually, Akshay has asked a question which I wanted to ask. That is uh, to Sri Lakshmi, that is purple. What is the relevance of the title? Purple hibiscus. Okay, ma'am. If a uh, flower some have different color, it denotes its hybridity. Here, the title purple hibiscus denotes the character, the main uh, protagonist in this novel, uh, Kambli, and it uh, uh, denotes her hybrid nature. And that hybrid nature she gets from Aunt Ephemer's house. And I think uh, that's why uh, it's called, that the novel is called Papa Hibiscus. It's denoted the hybrid nature, hybrid nature of uh, Kambli. Okay, the multicultural. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I think purple, that the word, uh, the color purple has another significance. Sita, can you explain that? No, I think uh, in this context, it is uh, related to the writer Adichie herself. Because yeah. Adichie is someone who talks about the multicultural nature of uh, identities, multicultural nature of cultures itself. So in that way, uh, Adichie is proposing uh, the idea of many readings rather than being a single reading uh, mm -hmm. of, of a single reading of culture. Okay. So I think that is the more relevant thing here. Actually, African literature is a very, very rich and potential area and offers a very mo uh, most illuminating fictional exp uh, exploration. The racial, yeah, yeah, yeah. post-colonial, uh, multicultural identities figure in these works. And we have uh, two faculty a teacher uh, among us who have done work in uh, multiculturalism. Prasad, Shri Prasad and Jyoti, can you add to this uh, discussion, please? Uh, thank you, teacher. I am very happy to listen to these wonderful lectures by, by, by uh, dear students, uh, especially uh, with regard to African literature. Uh, whenever you start a presentation, it would be nice if you give a general introduction of what African literature is. That will uh, be more beneficial for the students, especially for the uh, graduate students who are listening to this kind of uh, these kind of writers from different perspectives. 
therefore that will give them a clear cut idea of what these writers are trying to delineate in their particular works and uh, yes, sure sir next time we'll take sure, sure. consideration uh, for sure uh, and uh, one interesting thing i just want to note is that rather than uh, coming on the screen it gives us enough opportunities to listen to understand the way in which these students pronounce these words therefore uh, it's a wonderful experience if we are going to see the character in front of the screen you will be having more interest into their facial expressions but this is a wonderful opportunity i i really appreciate uh, these four students and the real makers of this uh, platform especially dr sita vijay kumar and the comparer who who had tried her level best to uh, in, uh, come into uh, what is the terms with these presenters it's awesome and uh, just uh, some value points with regard to african literature as such uh whether it's purple hibiscus or whatever it be you are going to find out these hybrid cultures that give way for multiculturalism in a different land we all know that africa is a continent it is not just a country it is having hundreds of countries you know uh, even though there are uh, more than 30 uh what is a different nations we have to split each country into different other nations too because it is a land rich in oral culture tradition the way in which they deal with the divine whether it's the forest whether it's uh water whatever it be they are having divinity in their daily affairs and during the period of invasion there was a kind of hybridity or multiculturalism between two different words especially invasion and colonization after that there was a hybrid terms such as uh, settlement and colonization and after this foreigners who uh, leave that land we can find internal colonialism and these days we are finding a new approach in that particular nation which can be termed as neo colonialism therefore all these factors uh what is it impact on the studies therefore it's a it's a it's a very difficult thing to define in very simple terms but these are all nice ideas and i'm very happy to listen to these nice words thank you thank you very much for giving this wonderful platform Jodi uh, do you have uh, please say a few words I think she's there and I don't so uh, yes madam Jodi yeah. teacher your phd is on uh, multiculturalism can you can you share something with them if you want um good evening to uh, all of you respected anjana madam dr seeda vijay kumar sri prasad sir and all my beloved students uh, i think vinita madam is also there in the meeting so at the outset i would like to congratulate uh, the the students as well as the organizers of the program and you have lent a lot of warmth and sincerity and within a short span of time you could organize such a uh, such a program which imparted a no lot of knowledge about african culture and speaking about african culture uh, we can find an amalgamation of different cultures and each country in africa is actually an embodiment of different races different cultures mixed together and uh, there have been discussions about yoruban culture there have been discussions about igbo tribe there have been discussions about uh, different types of narration so at the outset i, I would like to say that 
the very essence of African culture as delineated through your presentation and the suggestions, the valuable suggestions given by the knowledgeable teachers should be kept in mind. And next time when you are presenting, you can have a, a modified way of presentation in whatever way, in whatever aspects you would like to have. Because you yourself know that uh, there are no limitations actually. And you can keep your camera on or camera off. Uh, there are uh, actually a lot of opportunities. Uh, sorry, uh, there is a lot of scope. And at the moment, we ourselves are entangled in a lot of activities. Actually, I'm in, I'm in the midst of a cartoon program going on in television. My child is watching a cartoon. And meanwhile, I was listening to your program. So uh, this is a different scenario. And if you really try to make use of the opportunity that you are getting, you can do wonderfully well. And you can perform well, both academically and non-academically. So, and regarding multiculturalism, I am not much prepared to talk about it. But uh, I would like to say that uh, multiculturalism uh, is, uh, is actually an amalgamation of different cultures. And multiculturalism can be found everywhere, not only in African American literature, uh, sorry, African literature, Arabian literature. We can find it everywhere. And uh, identifying it in the right sense is the key here. So uh, wishing you all the best in all your future endeavors. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Aishwarya, shall we wind up, Anjana ma'am? Okay, um, I would uh, I would like to add a few words. I really congratulate Sita and uh, her crew of presenters today for their excellent work they have undertaken. And uh, one thing I am a bit disappointed is that, except for one question, um, they didn't respond. I don't know why, because today even they can, uh, you know, respond from within, uh, you know, in a covered manner, in a camouflaged manner. At least they could have uh, posted questions or suggestions or even uh, words of appreciation in the chat box. I think in a part of it, but I don't want you to be very passive listeners. Please engage in fruitful discussions. Okay, we are doing this for you. We could have done it even without you people. So uh, we are doing this for you. So you have to uh, come forward and talk to us. We have to uh, engage in fruitful discussions. So you can even ask Chechi. You can degree uh, You can ask for explanation. Questions and you can ask. See, Chechi, can you explain that story once again? You can ask them. So this is uh, books It's not uh, academic exercise, Allah. See, this is a, we are a group of book lovers who uh, engage in talking about or reviewing a book. About book, we can discuss. It's just a formal. Uh, it's not a, a formal. What's a very informal meeting of the um, students or the lovers of literature. Allah um, this is a very, very light, informal kind of discussion about books. Since as we are students, uh, as we are uh, students, uh, yes, we are also students of literature, we have to be, you know, always uh, reading something. So, um, Siddha, another suggestion that I have is give um, the, a theme for the next one. I mean, they can prepare uh, students who want to present um, reviews can prepare on that uh, particular themes. Um, uh, I want you to come forward. I want you to come forward and also should come forward and present your, uh, you know, whatever that you have read. Um, just as a book lover, how do you read a book? How do you review a book? So, um, it is um, full of good. Uh, Anita, you want to ask uh, you want to ask something? Um, uh, ma'am, uh, ma I want to add something. 
uh, it was wonderful, Sita. Congratulations uh, for coordinating such a wonderful uh, book talk, and uh, congratulations for all the presenters. And uh, I would like to ask a single question. So I think uh, it was Aparna who presented uh, Famish Rock. Uh, can you please uh, explain about uh, the spirit child for the degree students, Abiko, the presence of uh, mythology and uh, uh, the presence of semi-gods in uh, African fictions? Is Aparna Can you please explain? Is Aparna there? Adwait, Aparna is logged in. Is she here? If she is not, it's okay. Oh, she's Please, not. One minute. Ah, okay. She's here. She's here. Okay. Okay. Asara means the spirit child. Mm. Spirit child. It's not for me, uh, Aparna. It's for the uh, students because they should know about the. Um, mythology, the presence of uh, spirits and semi-gods in African fiction. That's right. Okay, continue. Aparna, please. Okay, Miss. Okay. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, the farm short that tells the story of Abeku. Abeku means a spiritual. Spiritual, uh, spiritual is uh, uh, spiritual is assigned to die at a young age. To return to the spirit realm and later be reborn. Uh, I repeat the point. Abeku is a spirit child who died at a young age to return to the spirit realm and later be reborn to the reborn to the earth. In the story, we have Asaru who is uh, who is died at a young age in order to go to the uh, spirit realm, but to the current. I think words are broken. I think some problem or network issues there. I hope it's okay. Parna? I think I think uh, students should uh, read more about the uh, the presence of um, African yes. mythology and culture in African fiction, yes, especially yes, uh, the the narrative uh, the narrative te techniques and the uh, different styles, especially magic realism, etc. In fiction, that's why I just wanted to just uh, students should be aware about all these things. That's why I just asked. Wonderful, okay. Nida. It's very good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vinita, for the feedback. So, uh, shall, shall we wind up, uh, Aishwarya? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I ensure this session will be profitable and fruitful for everyone present here. Thank you, one and all. Now, I invite Shedal Krishna of 3rd BA to deliver a vote of thanks. Okay. Whole has to dream, for if dreams die, Life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Langston Hughes. Respected faculty members and dear participants, on behalf of NSS College Pandalam, its entire fraternity and the organizing committee, I feel immense pleasure to take this opportunity to propose a word of thanks. It's been a very beneficial program for our entire English department. To our eminent principal, Dr. Venugopal Sir, who spared the time for giving an opportunity for the smooth conductance of this book talk. I would further extend a hearty thanks to Dr. Anjana Ma, our HOD, for always encouraging us. I take this opportunity to, to specially express my deep regards and gratitude to our coordinator, Dr. C. Damman for providing opportunities to organize such events for her conference in us. I would especially thank our beloved teachers for all the unfaltering support. My deep sense of appreciation and thanks to all presenters, Vijay Lakshmi R. of 2nd MA English, Abana Vijayan of 2nd MA English, Sri Lakshmi S. of 2nd MA English, Mekha is J. Kumar of Second M English who presented their books very well today. 
My sincere gratitude also goes to the Aishwarya Unni of Second MA English for her warm welcome and made it a successful event. Thanks to all the participants who chose to be live with us and attended the book talk with great enthusiasm. My sincere gratitude also goes to the organizing committee for taking topics that really matter in today's age and time. Last but surely not the least, I thank Adwe of Second of Third B English for all the technical support and for helping us. I'm hopefully sure that the collective approach would definitely help us regulate and manage our emotions better to the pandemic crisis we are looking at. One, I thank you all for with us this afternoon and I hope this should be a wonderful experience to each of you. We hope to conduct more book talks in the future of this. Thank you all. Thank you, Anjana ma'am. So, let's meet with more book talks in the coming one. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. We shall call it a day. Okay. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a fruitful day. No, okay. <laughs> okay. Bye. അതാകുമ്പം കുഴപ്പമില്ല ഇങ്ങനെയൊക്കെയാണ് നമ്മളിങ്ങനെ പറയും അവര് വല്ലൊക്കെ ചോദിക്കും നമ്മൾ ഉത്തരം പറയത്തില്ല